for you. Hello and welcome to the video. Within this video I'm sharing my Grapefruit Tropical IPA which I actually finalised last year but did not end up sharing due to a lack of time. I will be running through all steps and methods associated with this recipe in order as well as explaining everything. Once all of the steps are covered I will then finish by showing the end beer along with some tasting notes. So let's get started with the first step. The first step is to prepare your fruit. I usually do this at least a day before the brew. Start off by cutting as shown. This stops the fruit moving around when you put it down. This makes it easier to handle and naturally because this process involves a sharp knife, easier also means safer. You can also now see how thick the pith is, which is the white stuff. This all needs to be removed along with the skin. Leaving it on will not result in a nice flavour. I find that removing the skin in the way you see me doing here can often kickstart the removal of the pith. I am simply cutting as close to the fruit as possible. This is the first step because we want this to be frozen for at least three days before we thaw it for a day and then use it. By freezing the fruit you will break down the cell structures which make the fruit more fermentable and will then give you a better flavour as well as a truer colour from the fruit. Freezing will also stop most nasties in your fruit, but soaking in a bath of sodium metabisulfate for 10 minutes will finalise this process. Do this before adding it to your freezer. The biggest challenge of this process is removing the pith. I suggest you take the fruit apart in its natural segments and then you will find peeling the pith off much, much easier. Once I am done I add all of the fruit into freezer bags. I then add sodium metabisulfate solution for 10 minutes and then pour it out and add the bag straight into the freezer. This process might seem a little frustrating at first but you will soon get the hang of it. Next you should prepare your water profile ahead of your brew. This is something that you can get help with within Brewfava as shown here or your own brewing software of choice. I personally use the hoppy profile indicated here. I would certainly recommend this one, but naturally if you have a different preferred hoppy profile then you should run with that instead. Let's now get brewing and look at my tried and tested recipe along with recent brew day footage where I use the Grainfather G30 brewing system. I am sharing this recipe in full in the video's description with both metric and imperial measurements, as well as a link to the recipe on Brewfather which is free to use with some limitations, so as such ideal for everyone. This recipe can be used with all other brewing systems. To convert it to your brewing system on Brewfava, simply change the equipment section and scale it to the volume you desire. You should then replace my ingredients with your own and ensure the values for IBU and gravity match that for the original. This is easily done by using the recipe in the video's description for reference. Let's get this mash started. Shown on screen is the profile used for this mash. You can see here that this is not the tidiest look right now, but this is certainly nothing to be concerned about at all. A pretty look during any point of the mash does not have anything to say about the final beer. Let's now look at the vitals and fermentables. As you can see this has an estimated ABV of 6.3% and has a BUGU ratio of 0.88. I feel that this balance of alcohol and a bitterness best suits this recipe's combination. I have tried various different levels and what I share with you is the general consensus of what simply tastes the best. Looking at the fermentables now you will note that I am using Pilsner instead of Palau as the base malt. This is because I find that this combination of the crispness of the Pilsner malt rides this one nicer than Palau malt. It is backed up with some maltiness and a slight touch of sweetness from the Munich malt. The acid malt here at 5% is used simply to reduce the pH. You can remove this and replace it with more Pilsner malt if you would rather handle pH differently. You will also notice that I have a small amount of wheat malt which is added for head retention. You will not notice any flavour from it but it will add in some haze. In fact from this recipe the grain bill here as a total is more about backing than flavour because this will all come from our hops and our fruit. You will notice that I have not given a percentage in the recipe for the fruit. This is because it is just to be added during fermentation which I will cover later. It was then time to do some sparging. I prefer to do this by hand personally but make your own choices here as long as you can find a sure route to repeatable efficiency. Once at the boil it was then time to stir in the head. Not only does this protect against a boil over but it also keeps the protein in the wort which is pretty important for this one's look and taste in my opinion. 
This stirring in process is certainly easier in my opinion and just involves skimming the foam until it all drops down. Let's now look at the boil side of this recipe. For this one I personally prefer the result from a 30 minute boil. This leaves in a little extra flavour that is easier to experience than explain. With a 60 minute boil you can certainly use less bittering hops. Let me know which version you prefer once you have tried both. On the boil side we have additions here at 30 minute for bittering and then additions every 5 minutes from the 15 minute stage which will create the flavours and aromas desired, which is around big hop flavour and aroma. This combination will give a very tropical effect with grapefruit of course. You can expect this to be very citrus with pine, grapefruit, lemon, orange, mango and lychee. I've experimented with a large variety of grapefruit IPA recipes with different hop selections as well as grain bills. The hop timing and selection is key to making a grapefruit IPA really sing. With this lineup, I suspect your neighbours will even hear it. After adding each hop addition, be sure to give it a really good stir in. You want to see all of the vegetable matter drop down. At the same time, you will allow the hop oils to amalgamate with your wort fully. That's the thing about oil in general when added to liquid. It wants to stay at the top, whereas we need it to also drop. Naturally this does not just apply to IPA styles, but with IPA styles you will need to stir in for longer due to all of those extra hops. If you are lazy about this, then you will simply create a lazy hopped IPA rather than a singing hop IPA. As always, the choice is yours. Let's now move on to the cooling stage. Naturally I'm using a grain farmer here which is supplied with its own rather good counterflow chiller. This recipe calls for a hop stand at 80 degrees C or 176 Fahrenheit. I would strongly recommend that you use a different type of chiller to get your whole wort down in temperature fast. Here I am using the Jaded Brewing Siller, which I reviewed in a video recently and gave lots of immersion chilling advice. Here is the thumbnail for that video on the bottom right of the screen. Using this chiller with some of the tips in that previous video got me from boiling point to the desired temperature in less than one minute. Using a counterflow chiller would certainly take considerably longer and is really not what a counterflow chiller is designed for. Counterflow chillers simply cool small sections of your wall that then can be transferred rather than the whole liquid volume. This is of course great for brews without a hop stand of a lower temperature, but painful when there is. If you are short on cash, then making your own immersion chiller is cheap and easy. There are plenty of guides online available for you. After the hop stand, I cooled the wort and started transferring to my fermenter. Ideally, I would like to have fermented this one under pressure, but my pressure capable fermenters were already in use, so I went with the no pressure route. My yeast of choice for this recipe is Lallemans Vosk Fake, but a neutral yeast like US05 could also be used, as could Verdant IPA yeast for some extra tropical flavour. I personally prefer the result from Voss with this one, and I set the temperature to 35 degrees C or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature does not change throughout the fermentation, including when I add my fruit or the dry hops, which is coming next. Let's start with the fruit. This should be removed from your freezer the day before you intend to add it, so that it can thaw in your fridge. I suggest adding this when your fermentation is close to being done. With quake this is naturally very fast compared to regular yeast, so add your fruit on day 2 with quake if you are using a high temperature like mine. With regular yeast, wait until you are about 5-10 to 10 points away from your FG. In both cases you can add your hops at the same time as your fruit without concerns over needing to dry hop for more than 5 days. Before adding fruit you will need to at the very least remove all trub from your fermenter. If you have a fermenter that allows for trub dumping then you should certainly dump until you hit just beer. If not then you will need to transfer the beer into a fresh, clean and sanitary fermenter. This is what is known as secondary and it is vital if you want an EM beer to taste good. Every time I make a video involving fruit I mention this and every time I always get people asking if this is really necessary. Yes, it really is, if you want to have a nice clean tasting beer. Yes, I realise this is another process, but you should either do this or simply avoid creating beers with fruit. It really is that simple. I only say this to help you, not to cause you any hassle. Pouring trub down your sink always feels much better than pouring down a foul beer. Let's now look at the steps involved. With your fruit, I suggest preparing it as follows. Firstly, take a hop bag or similar and boil it for a few minutes. Be careful to stir it so that it does not burn on the bottom of your pan. 
Then with a clean and sanitary method, transfer the bag into a suitable container that is also, of course, clean and sanitary. Then add a diluted sanitizer. Some will say that this is not necessary, but caution has never failed me and it will never fail you either. There is simply nothing worse than a contaminated beer, after all. It's such a waste. Next, you should grab your fruit and some hand sanitizer. I guess everyone has some of this these days. Every time you touch anything other than the fruit, re-sanitize your hand or fingers. You can then start loading up your bag with the fruit. Once done, tie a knot in the top so the fruit cannot make an escape. By the end, your bag will be left with some juice and small bits. You can add this to the jug for pouring later. Avoid the small bits though, as they could cause clogging when you transfer and we do not want them in the end beer either. You can then add in your bag and then pour in the juice, ensuring that small bits are left behind. Naturally, you'll want to be using that hand sanitizer again before touching the bag after removing your fermenter lid. Better safe than sorry. When it comes to your dry hops, this is in principle the same process when it comes to making everything clean and sanitary, so no need to go through all of that again. Personally, I prefer to use stainless steel for dry hopping and these large tea strainers are ideal. Just make sure you never fill them more than halfway up, because they will expand and you want all of the oil. You will know that you have failed if you find any actual dry hops later on. Perhaps we should rename this to soggy hopping. When you add in anything at this stage into your fermenter, then be sure to place it into your wort so that it will drop down, rather than lingering at the top. In the case of dry hops, they will eventually drop, but this effectively lengthens the process, and this is something that you should avoid past five days, but three days dry hopping is plenty of time. This is to avoid any grassy flavours stopping you from enjoying your beer fresh, or in more extreme dry hop contact cases, leading to hop burn which is permanent. I still see plenty of recipes online that ignore this, but you would do well to ignore these recipes. You also need to be sure to not splash anything into your fermenter. This will avoid any potential problems with oxidisation. I have never actually experienced it with any of my brews, but I have tasted its effects, and again, it is just such a waste that can be avoided with the right techniques. Moving on now, here is the end beer and a close look at the pour itself. This beer will certainly be a hazy one unless you do something to aid in clarity, which for some is a form of sacrilege, but it will be your beer so it is your call. I have left this one natural. Here is the exact same pour with a full view of the glass. I have had many people comment that the beer actually looks like grapefruit juice, but in this light you may not see it. This pour footage has been increased in speed just in case you are wondering. Here is the same beer with different lighting that shows this beer's colours better. Naturally you get to see this in two different forms due to the nature of this glass. Here are my week two in the keg tasting notes. Aroma. The main aroma here is made up of grapefruit and citrus. I detect more orange than lemon and there is a nice level of pine in the background. Flavour. Very clean grapefruit that is found on entry, and then followed by a citrus array of orange, lemon and mango. There are some other flavours here in the background that give a real tropical edge to this one. The finish is not sharp or acidic as you would find with some grapefruit IPAs. This is by design as I found earlier versions of this recipe had this, and people in general preferred this more rounded, easy drinking version. Here are some notes. This recipe has seen various different versions to get it into this shape, but I strongly believe the end result has been very much worth it. I suggest drinking this one fresh for the best flavour in general. It does not need any more conditioning time than one week, and many feel that it tastes its best in the early weeks compared to six months later. This was certainly nothing to do with oxidation, as the beer kept its colour and had no other signs. It was simply a case of freshness. Here is my final impression. This is a very easy drinking beer that people find to be very tasty and refreshing. This is especially enjoyable during the hotter times of summer, as the flavour combination really quenches the thirst. Yes, this beer is not as simple as some, but you will never get this amount of clean grapefruit flavour without the use of fruit. I would really welcome anyone's impressions of this recipe once they have brewed it and tasted it. Do let me know via the comments section of this video. I do hope that you found this video useful, informative and interesting. If so, why not consider liking and subscribing? For further support you can join the channel's Facebook group, and if you would like to support the channel then check out the channel's merchandise store, as all profits go back into the channel. Until next time, happy brewing!